Should we have this set up here every week? Should we just leave this up all the time? And so uh, super excited for our surge camp. 500 kids will be here tomorrow. Best week of the year at Life Church. And uh, I don't know about you. I grew up in church. Can't remember a time I wasn't in church. And so much good in that. And, and, uh, and when I, the, the, up, the downside of some of that is, is uh, you know, there's things we learn as children, stories we learn, and we learn them through the lens of a child. And, and if we're not careful, we never come to a spot where we look at that story for, for a deeper meaning. And uh, today we're gonna look at the story of the feeding of the 5,000. I can't remember a time in my life where I hadn't heard that story. And you learn that as a child, and there's this very basic idea that's true, that, you know, you have the little boy sack lunch, and, uh, and he gives it to Jesus, and, and this, you know, principle, you know, we take what's in our hand, put it in God's hand, he does so much more than we could ever do. For sure, true, and for sure a beautiful truth. But today I want us to look at this story, and I, I think it really shows us a handful of just uh, uh, compelling things about who Jesus is. Is And so if you have your Bibles, go over to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 10. Context here, we looked at it last week. We talked about how Jesus has invited us to join his adventure. Last week, we saw Jesus sends out these 12 people, uh, his 12 disciples on mission, and they go, and they heal the sick, and they proclaim the, the gospel of the kingdom. And then, so this is where we're catching up the story, verse 10. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. Jesus replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. And there was about 5,000 men there, so probably like 15,000 people. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. This is an incredibly famous miracle. It's the only miracle other than the resurrection that we find in all four gospels. And, and really any time that, that Jesus was doing a miracle then, really any time God does a miracle today, there are some truths that are being declared uh, about who God is. And, and so here's the first thing I want to show you. One thing that Jesus is showing us here is that Jesus has power that is greater than our problems, that impossible problems for us are incredible opportunities for him, and that God can take our scarcity and create incredible abundance. And what's fascinating about this story is, is these disciples have seen Jesus do some epic miracles over and over and over again, and this right before this, Jesus has empowered them to do some miracles. And so uh, uh, this is within days of that happening, within weeks of seeing Jesus calm the seas, within just a couple of weeks of seeing Jesus raise the little girl from the dead, just within a couple of weeks of seeing the, the woman with the issue of blood healed. There's been miracle after miracle after miracle, yet they come to this moment where they have this problem, and their response is, let's send the people away. And then, and so why does this happen? Well, I want to share with you three reasons that I think the disciples uh, might have have had this instinct of let's just send them away versus expect something great from Jesus. I, I think the one thing that might be it is it's possible that maybe this miracle felt too big. There's 15,000 people that are needing to be fed. Now, I, I don't think that's what happened with the disciples, but I do think that, fall, that we fall into that trap. We find ourselves with a problem and it feels too big to even pray about. It just feels so big that it just feels, even though when we say it out loud, the idea of it being too big for God, we know that's not true, but subconsciously, I think we face these problems and we just feel like, oh, it's even too big for God. But I don't think that's what's happening with these people. 
Uh, I, I think what might be happening, though, is this, is, is their memories were short, even though it had been literally days since this, these incredible miracles have happened time after time again, literally days since they, they saw miracles happen at their own hands because Jesus had empowered them in this moment, they either weren't remembering that or they didn't see it as relevant to their situation today. I was uh, in Kenya a number of years ago. Uh, Life Church built a couple of orphanages over there, and there was this sweet lady there named Miss Rachel, and, 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 and she talked about how she had this journal that was called her faith account, and that every time God showed himself faithful and strong in big, big ways and small ways, she would write it in this journal, and then when life got difficult, she'd go back and relook at those stories of God's faithfulness and power, and it built her faith. And there's something powerful about that. Through the whole Old Testament, God tells the children of Israel over and over again to remember his faithfulness, remember him miraculously delivering them out of Egypt over and over to remember. And the reason God tells us to remember, the reason Jesus at the Lord's Supper says, hey, do this, eat this bread, drink this wine to remember me is that we're prone to forget I think about even just some of the challenges at Life Church, even in this season, whether it's just growing pains from how much we've grown uh, the last few years, or whether it's challenges as we navigate the city uh, on building things and and the hassles that come with that, or whether it's skyrocketing construction costs and these challenges. And, And then I remember back on God's faithfulness these last 18 years. I remember back when there was 130 of us, the church had $35,000 in the bank, and we began to buy these 10 acres, which cost $2 million then, which would likely cost like $7 million today, and just God's faithfulness through those moments, and then through the Great Recession, and, and it builds my faith for today. There's something powerful about reflecting on God's faithfulness in the past. But in this moment, maybe the disciples forgot what Jesus had just done in the previous days, or they didn't see it as relevant for the problem they were facing in that moment. I also think that they might have done something I think we do sometimes, is they were content to settle for the, quote, reasonable solution. These people are hungry. We don't want this big crowd of hangry people. That's never a good thing. Let's send them home. It was the reasonable solution. And I think many times we rush so quickly to the, quote, reasonable solution that, that, that we miss out on maybe something great that God has more for us. And see, sometimes what's, quote, reasonable is best, but it's not the best thing every time. Sometimes God's wanting to do something remarkable in us and for us. And so we have to remember that every problem is an opportunity for him to solve and that every lack is an opportunity for him to provide. Now, he might provide by giving you an opportunity to work. Every anxiety is an opportunity for him to bring peace. Every weakness is an opportunity for him to be strong in your life. Every sadness is an opportunity for him to provide comfort. And so what Jesus is saying in this miracle, and really in all of his miracles, is that he is greater, his power is greater than the problems we face. Here's the second thing. Jesus is showing us that he's absolutely unique in human history. He's got this pattern of this miracle after miracle. Luke's just showing us. And the calming of the storm shows us that Jesus is greater than nature. And the, and the casting the demons out of the gathering demoniac, Jesus is greater than evil forces. And the raising of, of the little girl who was dead, Jesus showing us that he's greater than death itself. Right here, what Jesus is doing is he's showing us that he's greater than every religious leader in all of history. See, what, what these Jewish people and this idea that, that Jesus in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness, Jesus providing bread in the middle of the wilderness would definitely have caused their minds to go to Moses uh, and with the children of Israel. And, 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 and as he was leading them, that God is providing this manna from heaven. And, and what, what we're supposed to see here, and Jesus spells it out in the book of John, but what we're supposed to see here is this message that Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses, for most Jews, would, would have said that, that he was the, the greatest hero of the Old Testament. And, and so this idea, Jesus 
greater than Moses, that, that Jesus provides himself uh, in this moment in the wilderness where they were hungry. It's to remind us of, where it wasn't at Moses' hand the manna came, it was from God himself. But this idea, Jesus greater than Moses in this miraculous provision that the one who God used to deliver a few million Jews out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt, that he's to point us to this greater one who, who would, would deliver all of us out of the bondage of sin and death, and that this, this one who God used to provide this law that none of us could keep perfectly is to point us towards the one who would keep the law perfectly on our behalf. And so this miracle is showing that Jesus is unique in all of history. He's greater than every single religious leader. His life, his teaching, his miracles, his death, and his resurrection make him unique in all of human history. Let me show this to you. There are a handful of people throughout human history, thought leaders, religious leaders, who, who have founded major religions or shaped a pattern of thought for centuries or millennia to follow. People like Moses or Buddha or Confucius or Plato or Aristotle or Mohammed, and Jesus certainly would fall into that category. There's been a handful of people throughout history founding religions or shaping the thought for generations, centuries, and millennia to follow. And then there's this other category of humans. There's another category of humans who, who have at some point in their life declared themselves to be God, declared themselves to be divine. There's been a, a number of these people throughout history. Now, what happens with those people is maybe they get a handful of people to buy off on that while they're alive, a David Koresh type figure. They get a handful of people to buy into that while they're alive, but then they die, and within a few years, everyone recognizes, oh, for sure, that wasn't God. But what Jesus is in unique in human history is that he's the only person who finds himself in both categories, both declaring them himself to be divine, saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, both declaring himself to be divine and at the same time be, causing billions of people to believe it for thousands of years, unique in all of history. And so what we're supposed to see here in this miracle that Jesus is greater than Moses, greater than any other religious leader ever to live. Here's the third thing that we're supposed to see from this miracle, that Jesus has incredible compassion and care for us. Every single miracle of Jesus relieved a very real human need, human problem, or human suffering. In Matthew's account of this story, let me show this to you. First, for chapter 14, verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. Key phrase here, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Why didn't Jesus send them away to go get their own food? It already tells us because his heart for them was already stirred with love and compassion. See, what we see, every single miracle of Jesus was for the purpose of relieving human suffering. See, some people's greatest objection to belief in God, it's probably the number one objection if you were to talk to 100 people that don't believe in God in America and say, "Why? Well, what's the biggest reason you don't believe in God? The number one reason would be, I can't believe in a God who is both good and all powerful and allows human suffering and injustice, so I don't believe in it. And, and in a sense, this makes sense. Why would a, a good and loving God allow suffering in, this, in the world? But I just want to point this out to you. This problem of outrage at, at human suffering or injustice, it's not simply a problem for the person who believes in God. It's equally a problem for an atheist 
who believes that there is nothing beyond what is natural, nothing beyond what's called naturalistic materialism. There's nothing beyond what can be seen and touched and tested with the scientific method. And that and that the reason they don't believe in God is because of evil and suffering in the world. So they say, I don't believe in God. So instead, I I just believe in materialistic naturalism. And I just believe in natural selection and survival of the fittest. But the the thing is this, if that is true, if if everything is just an accident of, 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 of natural selection, then this outrage that we have at Injustice and suffering really makes no sense at all. Tim Keller's written a ton about this. Let me read you this quote. He says, if there's no God and this world is all there is, how can you be totally morally outraged against what is absolutely natural? If the world is all there is and there's no God, then everything you see out there is natural. What things? Entropy. What is disease? What is decay? What is death? Entropy, everything is running down. It's absolutely natural. Disease, decay, and death are absolutely natural if there's no God. When you see the strong trampling on the weak, what is that? That's not entropy, that's evolution, and that's natural, this whole idea of the survival of the fittest. Utterly and absolutely natural. With all due respect, how can you account for your unbelievable non sequitur, this incredible moral outrage, against something that is utterly natural. So here's the idea. If at the end of the day, it's only what we can see, it's only what is natural and material, it's all just an accident and it's all just natural selection and survival of the fittest and the propagation of the species, our outrage at human suffering and and, uh, injustice makes no sense at all. I was on a plane the other day and uh, I'm on this plane flight. We've been up in the air 30 minutes, and then two rows in front of me, this person says, is there a doctor on the plane? And part of me, for a moment, wants to pretend to be a doctor. I'm like, let's see what I can do. I've watched a whole ton of Chicago Med. I think I've got this. Anyone ever was like, hey, let's... And, uh, and then a doctor comes, a couple of nurses come, all the flight attendants gather around, the whole flight gets very quiet, and, and, is, and, and it's this older gentleman, uh, two rows in, in front of us, older gentleman, and uh, he passed out. These people come, they gather, everyone's very, very concerned. He ends up all being okay. Uh, but but he, everyone's concerned. The flight attendants are all gathered around. This becomes the center of everything that's happening on this plane flight. Numerous people willing to help. People are bringing, uh, you know, the, uh, how do we test his blood pressure? All these things. This just becomes the focus of everyone on the plane. And, and I mean, absolutely no disrespect to anyone who finds themselves in the la- latter part of life. If it wasn't for old people, life church goes bankrupt, okay? And so, uh, but here's the thing. If all there is is natural selection. And if all there is is the survival of the fittest and the propagation of the species, when someone who is older, who's had all the kids they're gonna have, who, who, who has, has, has worked all the jobs they're gonna work, when someone who is older in that moment is sick, it makes no sense to care deeply about their life. The reason everybody on that plane, because if everything's just about the propagation of the species and the survival of the fittest, this person near the end of their life who's passing out is clearly not, quote, the fittest. And, And so this instinct of everyone on the plane to turn our attention towards them so whether if you believed in God, to pray that they'd be okay. If you had medical skills to come and try to help if you could. If you didn't believe in God, to, to think positive thoughts. The reason that everybody cared about this older man's sickness is because deep inside of us, we know there's something more than everything being a giant accident and natural selection and the survival of the fittest being all there is. Because if we really, really believed that it really is just about natural selection and survival of the fittest, when we see the strong take advantage of the weak, 
We just say, well, that's just how it is. That's just the way it works. That's just what's natural. But this thing in us that, that, that just says this human suffering's not right, and, and the strong taking advantage of the weak, it's not right. And that thing that causes some people to say, why would a good, kind, all-powerful God allow that? That's that thing in us that knows there's something more than that. Now, here's the thing. Every religion has to answer that question. And it's a very, very difficult question question. Keller says it this way. He says, people say, why in the world does God allow all this evil and suffering? He says, I think almost every other religion has to say, I don't know why God does that. Christians also have to say, I don't know. But Christians can say one more thing, and it's pretty important. One thing we know is he hates it. How do you know that? Look at every miracle. None of these miracles were tricks to show you how powerful he was. Every miracle was an assault on the destruction and devastation. It was an assault on decay. It was an assault on injustice. It was an assault on disease and an assault on death. When John the Baptist sends Jesus a message that says, how do we know you're the Messiah? What does he say? He says, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, and the poor have the good news preached. Look at this, the blind see, physical brokenness. I come against that, he says. The lepers are cleansed, spiritual uncleanness. The, the, the lepers were not allowed to go into God. They were not allowed to go into the tabernacle, spiritual alienation. I come against that. I'm here to liberate the poor, social injustice and alienation. Jesus says, I hate that stuff, and I've come to do something about it. See, the best answer that I have ever heard about why is there such brokenness and suffering in the world is that God created it never to be that way, but God, because he desires a love relationship with us and where there's no choice, there's no love, gives us free will, and with our free will, we, sin enters the world, and in that, with that brokenness and death and destruction, everything wrong, but then what we see is a God who chose to come and live in our suffering, chose to come and join us in our suffering, chose, chose to suffer for us, uh, dying a death on a brutal cross that he ultimately might come again one day, talk about it more in a minute, and, and eliminate all of this. He, what we see in these miracles of Jesus as he meets real human needs is that he cares deeply, this great love and compassion that cares deeply for our suffering. This was all a part of his grander mission. Here's the last thing and we're done. What we see is that Jesus has a mission that's greater than any singular miracle. Really, the vast majority, if not every single one of Jesus' miracles, point to his ultimate mission. Let me show this to you. His miracles often point to the cross. They often point to the renewal of all things. Let me show this to you. Luke 9, 16. It says, Jesus, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Can you think of any other time where Jesus took some bread and he broke it and he thanked God for it? When we read this story, we're supposed to look ahead to the Last Supper. Luke 22 reads very similar. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus here is feeding these 5,000 people, he's foreshadowing his ultimate mission. He's foreshadowing that moment where, where he's gonna take some bread and he's gonna bless it and he's gonna give it to his friends and he's gonna say, this bread is a picture of my body which I'm gonna give for you in a matter of hours. It's, we're supposed to look forward to that. When we see Jesus feeding these 5,000 people, he's also foreshadowing his, his ultimate renewal of all things that when Jesus one day will come back and he will usher in his kingdom in all fullness, what he's saying is just like in this moment that these 5,000 people, 5,000 men, probably 15,000 people where they were no longer hungry, what he's saying is I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna establish a kingdom where no one will ever 
go to bed hungry. See, when Jesus, when Jesus' his very first miracle, and he turns the water into wine, he's foreshadowing right near the end of his life where he's going to take some wine and say, this wine is a picture of my blood that I'm going to shed for you in a number of hours. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he's foreshadowing his own death and resurrection. He's, he's foreshadowing the fact that we, being spiritually dead, will be made alive because of his ultimate mission. Here's what N.T. Wright said about this. He said, Jesus' feeding of the multitude is a signpost to the new world that is being born through his work, a world in which the poor are fed and the dead are raised. See, when Jesus feeds these 15,000 people, bringing fullness to their hunger, he's pointing to a time where there will be no more hungry people, when he makes everything wrong right in the renewal of all things. And when he, when he heals the sick, he points to a time where there will be no more sickness in the renewal of all things. When he raises the dead, he points to a time where there will be no more death. Revelation 21 verse 4 says it this way. Looking forward to the end, when Jesus makes everything wrong in the world right, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Why? For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So all of these miracles of Jesus, he's pointing to this ultimate mission. He's pointing to the cross. He's pointing to his second coming where he will come and, and, and renew all things. And he's pointing to our greatest need. They point to the fact that, we, that more than any single miracle, the, the miracle we need is him. Let me show this to you. In John's account of the feeding of the 5,000, John 6, 25. He says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? There's a, there's a series of really dumb questions going to be asked in this little time here. They said, Jesus, when did you get here? Well, the fact is they were following him over. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. They, these people, feeding the 5,000, they had the best lunch they'd ever had. And they're like, what's Jesus feeding us for dinner? He says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. He says, hey, well, you, th you think you're here for lunch. You think you're here for dinner. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm about forever stuff, about eternal life. Then they asked him, what must, we, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. He says, hey, the big, the big thing is me here. So they asked him, Again, incredibly dumb question. What sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Jesus is like, I literally fed 15,000 people five hours ago. Like, hey, Jesus will show us. Show us that you're special. It's like, you literally are here right now because you wanted dinner after I fed 15,000 people five hours ago. Here's the truth. For some people, no amount of evidence will ever be enough. They had all the evidence they possibly could have needed. They're like, Jesus, do something really great now. And then they said, what sign do you give us? So we say, he says, what will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. See, again, we're supposed to think about Moses here. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Again, they still are not getting any of it. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. They're like, that sounds like the best bread I've ever had. That sounds like bread from Peren. Here's the, by the little aside about Peren. I respect any business model that can do stuff so awesome that they can grossly overcharge and have lines out the door. That's when you know your business model is killing it. So they're like, Jesus, that bread sounds like the best bread ever. They're so, so, so dumb. Always give us that bread. <laughs> and Jesus declared, it's me. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be hungry thirsty. See, the thing is what we see in this miracle here is that our perceived and our pressing needs 
are always mere shadows of our true ultimate need. Jesus says, you don't need dinner, you need me. You don't need me to give you more bread and more fish. You need me, the bread of life. What he's saying is I'm the only thing that'll bring you ultimate satisfaction. He says, no matter how great your last meal was, sometime in the next day or two, you're gonna be starving again. I'm the only thing that brings lasting satisfaction. What he's saying is I'm, I'm what you really need both to live life now and to live forever. Verse 40, he skips down, he keeps going on this whole thing with these guys. In verse 47, I tell you that one who believes has eternal life, I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus says, I'm what you need to really satisfy both now and forever. You think your biggest problem is your physical health. It's not, it's, it's a forever problem. And I'm here to solve your problems now and forever. You think your biggest problem is financial. That's not it. It's simply pointing to your spiritual bankruptcy. He says, all of these things are pointing to your need for me and I'm here to meet your ultimate needs. And that what you really need now to, to, to live now and forever. What he's saying is I'm about to give my body in death so that you can really live, verse 51. He says, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I don't consider myself an expert in too many things. I do consider myself sort of an expert on bread. I love great bread. You're like, yeah, we, we can see. And so uh, stop going to Perrin. Um, but here's the nature of bread, a few things about it. If you don't accept the bread, you have to receive it. If you don't receive the bread, people can offer you bread all day long, but if you don't take it and eat it, you'll go hungry. You have to receive it for it to make a difference. And anytime anyone offers you any kind of food, it always involves trust. Sometimes my kids will come up to me like, hey, dad, taste this. And I'm like, I feel like there's like a 40% chance you want me to taste this because it's terrible. And I just look at him and I'm like, no, I'm good, I'm good. No, dad, it's really good. I don't believe you. It's, uh, my dad was pastor in a small little church and they did a lot of potlucks, potluck dinners. And Life Church, if we do like a big dinner, our typical method is we're gonna provide the, the main dish, we'll do hamburgers and people can bring sides and that way you can at least know this hamburger should be good. Because you never know who's bringing the potluck stuff and in our this little church, there was this sweet old lady named Virginia. And everyone knew that Virginia had 17 cats. Hey, and if you've got 20 cats, we've got people that can pray that off of you. And so, uh, I, um, and so in the line for the potluck, and, and I don't know if it was because of the cat fur in the food or she just wasn't a good cook, everyone just knew Virginia's food was gonna be terrible. And sweet, sweet lady, but you know, just wasn't the cook. Not everybody is. It's all good. And so, uh, but in the line for the potluck, it just became part of the church's DNA that they're going to all tell you which one was Virginia's because you couldn't trust Virginia's food. And, the, and she's in heaven now. She's fine. And so, uh, but the thing is about whenever you eat something, it's a matter of trust. And so there's this, you got to receive it for yourself. It's got to exercise trust. And here's the thing about bread or any kind of food. No one can eat it for you. It's always got to be a personal decision. And, and what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, I am the bread of life. And, 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 and he's saying, hey, you can accept it or you can reject it. If you're going to accept it, it's going to be by, by trust. And no one can decide it for you. But I am what you really need both in this life and forever. Let me pray for you. Yeah, and maybe this message for you made you think about something going on in your life. And maybe right now you feel like you're facing a problem that just feels too big for you and part of you feels like it even feels too big for God. And Maybe it's something going on with your health or your finances or somebody you love. And you could even just the quietness of your heart just confess to God that, that you recognize that he has more power and is bigger than your greatest problem. 
Or maybe you've never thought about the fact that, that Jesus is absolutely unique in human history, and maybe at times you think that there's just got to be a thousand paths to God, and what Jesus says is just as good as what some other religious leader says, or, but, and, and maybe even today, just the, the light kind of began to go on that there's never been anybody like Jesus. And he's greater than every other teacher and every other founder of every religion. He's absolutely unique in history. Or maybe there's this thing in your mind where you just, as you experience difficulty or you look at suffering in the world, you're like, man, does God even care that the world's so broken and my life's so painful? And I do just want to encourage you that it was never supposed to be this way. And you were never supposed to experience the pain you're experiencing, and the world was never supposed to experience the pain it's experiencing, was never supposed to be that way. And that Jesus chose to engage our broken world. He chose to suffer not just with us, but for us. And that one day he's going to come again and he's going to make everything wrong in the world right, and he cares deeply. Every miracle of Jesus shows that he cares deeply about your pain, and, he care, and he's with you in it, and, and it's not gonna be this way forever, and one day he will come, and he will wipe away every tear from every eye, and there will be no more sickness, and there will be no more sadness, and there will be no more crying, and there will be no more dying. And maybe you're here today, and as you think about this whole idea of Jesus as the bread of life, this this bread that is what I ultimately need, this bread that is the source of eternal life, what Jesus is saying is more than any other miracle, the miracle you need is the miracle of me, a relationship with me, building your entire life on me. And maybe you've never come to a spot where you've made that choice made that choice to to build your entire life on the person of Jesus, to see what Jesus is saying, that I'm the bread of life. He's saying, I'm what you need to survive. And in a world that knew what it was to not have, know where their next meal was coming from, there was nothing more important than than having bread. He's saying, I'm the most important thing that you need to survive to thrive in this life and to thrive and live forever. I am the miracle that you need. And maybe, that, maybe even in this moment, there's something in your life, that, in, in your mind that's saying, this is what I need. I believe that Jesus is unique in all of history. I believe he's the bread of life, and I want to become a follower of Jesus, and I just want to give you a chance to do it. You could pray something like this in your heart. God, I need you. I believe that Jesus is the bread of life. I believe he's what I desperately need, and I believe he is your son. And I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose from the dead. And I believe that that he is what I desperately need. And I don't want to keep living life where I'm in charge, but I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.